My name is Dan Battier, and I'm an adjunct fellow here at Hudson Institute. Today, it is my great honor to host this conversation with a champion of freedom, Leopoldo Lopez. Uh, Leopoldo, thank you very much for taking time to uh, be here at Hudson today. Um, a lot has happened in the last year, uh, both within Venezuela and in the international environment. Have the prospects for change in Venezuela uh, improved? How do you see things? Well, thank you, Dan, and thanks to Hudson for this opportunity. Um, we continue to face uh, the same problem, which is a dictatorship, and it's becoming clear to us and to the world what type of dictatorship we are facing, uh, because now it's very clear that Maduro uh, is the head of a criminal organization. And I am not exaggerating when I say this, because the Venezuelan economy that used to be an oil economy, um, we used to produce 3.7 million barrels of oil per day. Today, we're producing a bit over 600,000. Um, and the economy changed to become a criminal economy, mm -hmm. sustained on the elaboration um, and trafficking of cocaine, uh, on the extraction of blood gold with the destruction of the um, environment in Venezuela, uh, with the extraction with very opaque ways of extracting and commercing the um, oil in Venezuela, and also um, contraband. So that's the economy in Venezuela. And it's, it's a, it's a deep-rooted criminal structure that has links with the military, that has links with external actors, uh, like the uh, Cartel de Sinaloa, like the FARC, like the LAN, Hezbollah. And all of this, we've been saying it for years. But now, it's not us saying it. There are several reports that sustain that what we are facing now is a criminal enterprise that has taken control of the Venezuelan territory. So does this um, take us away from the will to fight for freedom in Venezuela? No. But it opens uh, our eyes and the eyes of those who want to understand the complexity of Venezuela of what we are facing. Because many times we are faced with this idea that um, the problem of Venezuela should be solved amongst Venezuelans. And that's, you know, that's a very nice phrase to, to put out there, right? It says, well, the problems of your children should be solved you know, with their children. But no, this is something very different. The reason why Maduro is still in power is because of the external support he has from non-state groups, the ones I mentioned before, and also from the main adversaries of the United States, from Russia, from Iran, from China, from Cuba, from Belarus. These are the main partners of Nicolás Maduro. And from that partnership, Maduro has been able to evade sanctions. From that partnership, he's, uh, he's been able to sustain the military, to equip the military. Through that partnership, he has gotten um, diplomatic support from the UN Security Council downwards to any uh, multilateral space where we have these actors. So that's what we are facing. Um, and in that sense, I believe that the struggle for freedom in Venezuela should not only be the struggle of freedom of Venezuelans, but also of anybody who truly believes in freedom and democracy as universal values. So you've, you've described a wide range of enemies of freedom in Venezuela and friends of the regime. Um, looking at uh, possible presidential elections in 2024, uh, what is the mood of the democratic opposition in Venezuela when you consider this uh, array of, of uh, enemies uh, uh, opposed to freedom in Venezuela? So uh, first, there is supposed uh, we are supposed to have an election mm -hmm. in 2024. Mm -hmm. Why I say we're supposed to have mm -hmm. it? Because there is no date yet. Mm -hmm. And Maduro mm, goes publicly and says, well, I might have it in 24. Or maybe if I like, I can have it in 23. Or if things are not right, we can have it in 25. Um, most of the candidates are disqualified to run for office. Um, Juan Guaido uh, had to leave Venezuela, and he was... Um, taken away not from Venezuela, but from Colombia. So, you know, the level of, of, of uh, repression, uh, it's even going beyond the borders of Venezuela. There are no conditions for the election. So uh, I think it would be foolish to look at Venezuela 
and the prospects for change in Venezuela through a lens of a normal election. And that's very tempting because that's the way most analysts look at things and, and politics here in the U.S. and elsewhere. You look at an election, you look at polls, you see, you know, who's ahead, who's behind, you know, what are the districts and what's going to happen. Um, but that, that would be a misguided way to look at, the, at what we are facing. Having said that, that this is not going to be a free and a fair election, it is an opportunity to reorganize uh, and to mobilize the democratic sectors in Venezuela. We have been fighting for over two decades. We have been at the height, we have been at the low. Uh, we have been very close to making change possible, or we have been in um, massive frustration um, by, by the sentiment of the Venezuelan people. So it's been very long, and uh, that uh, it's one of the adversaries that we need to engage with, which is hope, how to rebuild hope. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, there is a general agreement by most of the uh, democratic um, organizations and, and leaders in Venezuela to go to a primary process, to have the people decide who is going to be the candidate, uh, in my view, it's not only who is going to be the candidate, but who is going to lead in this new phase in the struggle for freedom in Venezuela. So the importance for me is that this is an opportunity to organize, to mobilize, to showcase what is happening in Venezuela, and to inject hope into the Venezuelan people about the prospects for change. So you've, you've mentioned that many candidates have been, uh, have been disqualified uh, by the regime. Uh, does that leave any, uh, does that leave any uh, solid um, candidates uh, still, in the, still in the mix for the primaries? Well, uh, of the candidates that are running today, um, all of the candidates are uh, known by the Venezuelan people because there are some candidates that are completely unknown. But those who are known uh, and that have... Um, some level of support by the Venezuelan mm -hmm. people are disqualified. Mm -hmm. um, and this is something that we, that we need to face, uh, that most probably um, we could have an election with none of the candidates that are today um, putting their names uh, for the Venezuelan people to choose. Why is that? Because they might end up being disqualified. So again, I think what's important is to understand that this is an opportunity to reorganize and mobilize the Venezuelan people. If we have the opportunity to vote in the election, uh, I, and if there are minimum conditions, I have no doubt that the Venezuelan people will massively vote against Maduro. Because Maduro is not just that the Venezuelan people have a bad opinion of him. It's way beyond that. Uh, people hate Maduro. People really despise Maduro. They identify Maduro and his regime as the source of their calamities, of the humanitarian tragedy, of the economic collapse. Um, so uh, it, it, it won't be easy to bring Maduro to a free and fair election. Uh, but on our side, what we need to do, again, is to rebuild a new cycle of hope, a new cycle of mobilization. And, uh, and the way uh, that we are going to do that is by calling on the people to have a say on who should be leading, with what views, um, with what you know, political uh, looking forward. Uh, and, and I think that's, uh, that, that's the opportunity that we have at the moment. There are now 7 million fewer Venezuelans in the country uh, than a few years ago. What does that do to the, to the possibilities for that kind of mobilization? Well, it, the, the country completely changed. Um, Venezuela has undergone a massive exodus um, and, and very fast. We have a population of 30 million. Uh, almost 8 million people have left our country. Uh, and this happened over the past nine to 10 years. Uh, so when I went to prison in the year 2014, there were n no more than 500,000 Venezuelans living abroad. Today, almost 25% of the population, 8 million people. Each person um, has a story about why they left Venezuela. It's, it's, very, it's very telling for me that every Venezuelan that has left um, can tell a story to their Colombian, to the Spanish, to the Americans that they see in the streets a very compelling and, and personal story about why freedom matters. Mm -hmm. So these are people who might not have uh, a theoretical uh, background on, on political science and freedom and all of these concepts, but they get to the core of what it means to be free. 
because they are fleeing our country and they have fled our country looking for freedom, looking for opportunities, looking uh, for what the regime has taken away uh, from them. Uh, and this is going to have an electoral impact, of course. There are uh, 8 million people who will not be able to vote. We're doing our best to have those people vote outside Venezuela. It won't be easy because the regime uh, doesn't want that to happen. Um, but what's important is that this has also changed our country in a way that today every single family in Venezuela has somebody outside, uh, a child, a parent, or a cousin, or somebody, or a neighbor who is living outside. So our country is really changing. Now we are a very different Venezuela from the one we were before, um, mostly for the bad, but I think that there are, there are also positive aspects coming from this massive migration. I think we will learn good things from other countries, and hopefully um, that could be put uh, back into the rebuilding of, uh, of Venezuela as a nation. Can you talk about the uh, social control that the Maduro regime has been able to exert in, in Venezuela? So um, since Chavez uh, took a hold to power at the turn of the century, he immediately created a very tight alliance with Fidel Castro. That was the first international alliance, and it was uh, very, very influential in the destruction of democracy from within. Uh, and it was very influential in the ways in which um, um, the social control was imposed on millions of people. And there is not one thing um, that, that creates social control. Mm -hmm. It's a sum of many things. And I'll give you some examples. Um, so fear plays a, a, a predominant role in social control. So the way to impose fear is uh, by identifying people from different sectors and uh, going after them. So the regime has been, over the years, and this has been happening for over 10 years, they've been identifying um, representatives from the business sector, from the union leaders, from uh, the teachers' unions, from um, the peasants or, 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 or the, the, the farmers, mm -hmm. uh, from the student movement, from just regular people. And they identify just random individuals. They put them into prison for posting a tweet or for protesting or for um, asking for uh, their rights to be respected, and they showcase that um, repression, and that creates great levels of fear. And I'll give you a very concrete example of this. Uh, a couple of months ago, um, an old lady, she must have been over 70 years old, uh, she posted a tweet with a joke, and in her joke she was making fun of Maduro and making fun of Chavez. Well, the, the political police, the Sevin, went to her house. They put her into prison. They made a big scandal about this. Uh, and it became very clear that the message was, don't do anything with your Twitter. I mean, don't post this type of messages. Don't even joke uh, about uh, the, the regime or about Maduro, because this can happen to you. Um, so this is one way of exerting social control. The other is by impoverishing the, the society and creating great levels of dependency for the very basic things that people need. So there has been, uh, over the years, an impoverishment of the Venezuelan population to a point where today the, the GDP per capita of Venezuela is equivalent to the GDP per capita of IT. The Venezuelan economy is it's, um, um, smaller than the Dominican Republic economy or the Guatemalan economy when we were the fourth largest economy in, in South America. Um, so we have a very impoverished uh, nation, uh, and the regime creates well, ways of dependency through um, controlling the food supply, controlling access to medicine, and they do this in ways in which it's all politicized. So the way you have access to food is if you are part of the, of the groups that uh, are uh, controlling the different communities by, by the dictatorship. Um, and then there is another layer, which is the use of technology. And here, um, the collaboration not only of Cubans, but of the Chinese has been very important. So Ma the Maduro regime started to use a QR code over 10 years ago. So they had this, the, 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 the card of the motherland. And in the card of the motherland, every um, individual has a QR code. And in that QR code, there is all of the information about that person, uh, information of what programs that person is using, what uh, type of access they have to different 
uh, benefits of a very few that the regime can give. Um, and they uh, use that card for in also imposing um, threat on the people. So uh, over the past 10 years, in every election, when people go out to vote, they go out to the voting uh, booth, but then they have to go to a different table outside the voting uh, uh, parameters where they have to join a line, show their QR code, and make it very clear that they actually um, contributed to the revolution with their vote. The regime might not even know who they voted for, but the important thing is the social control at a psychological level. Everybody thinks that with that QR code, you know, the, the regime has all of the information. So again, um, and then there is another layer of social control, which is censorship and, and, free, uh, and, and the lack of, uh, of free press. So the, the regime, um, over the past 20 years, they've been sustained in a sustained effort to control TV, to control radio, and recently to control, uh, or at least to greatly influence social media. So these are all different ways in which the end result <clears throat> is, uh, is social control. So there is not one thing, again, it's, uh, but, but there is one objective, to control the people, to oppress the people, uh, and to take people away from their hope of being free. Oh, sobering. Uh, so we, you've talked about how Cubans and Russians are, are involved in supporting the regime. It, do we see coordination among the regime's different author, authoritarian allies? Oh, for sure. Uh, and, and I think that this is something that requires a lot more attention. There is a lot of talk about the rise of autocracy, mm -hmm. uh, which is true. I mean, there's been um, 17 years uh, of recession in, in democracy worldwide, uh, and the counterpart of that is a, a rise in, in autocratic regimes. But I think what is getting less attention is the level of collaboration and of network among autocracies. And I can speak you know, very clearly about this because we have seen this in Venezuela. As I said before, Lavrov was in Caracas two weeks ago, and the foreign minister of Iran was in Venezuela a, a month, a month and a half ago. Um, and they uh, have all been building this network of different uh, ways of, of providing support. Um, to give you an example, through Iran, Venezuela was able to evade sanctions. So there was an imposition of sanctions to the oil sector. Venezuela used another oil, sanctioned oil economy like Iran to evade sanctions. They pay a discount, but in the end, they don't care. They, they, are, they are putting their, uh, their uh, gold and their oil out in the market. Um, another example of collaboration is the military collaboration between um, Russia and Venezuela. Since the year 2007, Venezuela started to shift uh, all of its uh, equipment and training from a US-led uh, type of, um, uh, of, of, of equipment uh, to Russian. Uh, and what started with um, repairing a couple of airplanes ended up with the largest uh, military uh, supply uh, to South America by Russian. So all of the air defenders, uh, and the, the missiles, the anti-missiles um, are coming from Russia with a huge investment. And Venezuela invested over $20 billion in buying equipment from Russia. Um, then you have with the Chinese, um, which is very surprising. I was uh, reading this morning a, a report about the, the, the lending of Chinese worldwide. And between 2000, um, I think it's 2008 to 2014, 15, Venezuela was the country in the world that received uh, the largest financial support from China. Uh, so as you can see, you have military support, you have financial support, you have support for evading sanctions, for energy. So there is a, a, a clear collaboration. In my um, conversations with people who, like me, um, are pro-democracy um, defenders, uh, people who have been in prison, who are now in exile, um, talking about them, countries like, like, like Zimbabwe, like Nicaragua, like Cuba, um, like Belarus, like, like many others, um, they have a very similar understanding that they are not only confronting uh, their own autocrat, um, but also this network of autocracies that is giving um, great levels of support uh, to autocrats to maintain a hold to power. So I think this is an issue that requires um, a lot of uh, in-depth analysis to really understand these this networks, 
the kleptocratic network is it's, it's a very obvious one uh, that would require the collaboration between analysts and the law enforcement community to, to dismantle this kleptocratic network. Uh, but as I said before, it's happening in different spheres um, of, of collaboration. One of them that we see every day is a Russian influence in the social media conversation in Venezuela and elsewhere. Um, as you know, Russians are experts in disinformation, uh, and they have developed uh, a way of influencing uh, the, the dynamics within social media um, to great levels. I mean, if, imagine if that happened here in the U.S. with all of the free media that you have, with all, with all of the actors involved in the, in, the, um, in the communications ecosystem. I mean, you have millions of actors here, and you still talk about Russian influence meddling with the elections 2016, 2020. You still have the discussion about Russian influence in the Brexit discussion. So imagine for a second what it's like in a closed society. I mean, the level of influence and of, um, of, of, um, yeah, of, of influence to, to the conversation in social media, uh, it's, it, it's very, very high. So these are all ways of uh, autocrats to collaborate amongst each other. So I, I would like to, I'd like to get your perspective on how, how the United States should should uh, be responding to this. First, in the first place, how should the United States uh, support the democratic movement in Venezuela and help, help to uh, promote conditions for democratic change? But second, how should the United States counter uh, the, uh, the actions we're seeing from uh, all of these external actors in, in Venezuela? Well, I, I think that uh, there needs to be um, kind of a policy definition of what are the priorities. With the case of Venezuela, it seems to me that, uh, that it, it, sometimes it does, at least it's not clear to me what is the priority in the policy towards Venezuela. Because I hear some people saying that um, stabilizing the dictatorship is going to contain migration, which is you know, the big issue here, right? Migration is it's, it's an issue of, of uh, great importance in the political discussion here in, in the US and in Washington, DC. So I hear some people say, well, if we contain the people in Venezuela by stabilizing the dictatorship, we're going to um, at least give a partial to solution to the massive migration coming out of Venezuela. Well, it's not true. It's not happening. Uh, it has not, and it will not happen. Then I hear other arguments that I also believe that are mistaken, um, that, that think that Maduro can become a credible source of energy for the hemisphere, and that is it won't happen. It won't happen for different reasons. First, uh, the level of investment and the time in order for the Venezuelan oil and gas output to be significant, uh, it's, it's very large. In terms of billions of dollars, we're talking more than $20 billion of investment. In terms of time, we will be talking about maybe at least five to six years uh, in, before you see a big, significant change in volume. Uh, but on the other hand, Maduro will continue to be Maduro. So I think we need to learn le lessons. Um, I think that Europe learned a very tough lesson in their partnership with Putin, with Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2, by giving the, you know, the, the energy dependence to Russia. In the end, you know, Putin was Putin, and he did what he did. Um, and I think that's a very clear example of why uh, the United States, uh, or any democratic country, should rely on an autocratic regime for their energy stability. Um, and I think that the third issue that today I see it um, in, the, in the lower levels of the priority list is the transition to democracy. Uh, and, and I think that the transition to democracy should be a policy that, uh, should, that should be analyzed across the board. So it should be part of the discussion about the economic policy. You know, what's the impact of the economic policy towards a place like Venezuela for democracy? So if, if, if an economic policy, like for example, well, uh, opening the sector or giving a license to um, a U.S. company like Chevron, is that going to have a negative impact in the process towards democratization? Well, I think that that should, that should not be a priority. Um, so uh, I think that this should be true for also how to um, analyze other countries is, well, how does the security, the economic uh, policies towards these autocratic regimes affecting the, uh, the, 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 the potential for uh, democratic transition. 
uh, I would hope that democracy um, gets to the point of the, being the main priority. Uh, as I said before, I see these other two competing priorities, energy and migration. Um, I, again, as I said before, with a, a mistaken premise, in my view. Um, and what I would hope is to see more of the, more of, uh, the commitment uh, towards democracy. And we are not talking about the United States doing the, the work that the Venezuelan people should do, or the Nicaraguan people, or the Cuban people. Um, I'm talking about identifying ways in which these um, uh, movements and individuals could be strengthened in their confidence, in their capacities, uh, and in, in their support uh, to continue to, to fight and to call for freedom in their own countries. I want to shift to, uh, to the world outside of Venezuela. You uh, co-founded uh, an organization uh, aimed at uniting and training uh, pro-democracy activists working in author authoritarian countries around the world. Can you tell us more about this initiative? So I, I, um, I spent the you know, last 20 years fighting against the dictatorship in Venezuela. I was uh, mayor for eight years, and I was disqualified to run for office. Then I started a movement, a uh, civil resistance movement in Venezuela. We called for protests that took me to prison, so I spent the next seven years in confinement. And at the end of 2020, I was able to leave Venezuela, to escape Venezuela against my will, but um, I had no, uh, no other alternative at the time. Um, and it was very difficult at the time to figure out you know, wh what to do and, and how to uh, channel the, the fight for freedom in Venezuela. So uh, I started to meet different people, and I started to meet people who, like me, had been uh, political prisoners from different countries, from, from China, from Iran, from uh, South Sudan, from uh, Belarus, and um, we started talking, and it became very clear the more we got to know each other that we were facing very, very similar uh, problems, uh, that we were very different, or skin color, or religion, or institutions, the history of our countries, the continents. Uh, we couldn't be more different. But we, we were talking about uh, the, the struggle for freedom and, and the will to fight for democracy. It was the same conversation. I was talking to brothers and sisters. I mean, it was uh, a really eye-opening experience for me. So alongside with Gary Kasparov from Russia and Masih Alinejad from Iran, uh, we decided to launch this idea called the World Liberty Congress to gather uh, pro-democracy and freedom fighters from autocratic uh, countries uh, and to meet, to learn from each other, and to figure out uh, an action-oriented agenda that could strengthen our particular fight in our countries and the global fight to visibilize what we are facing. Because I can sit here and talk about Venezuela um, and about the struggles that we are facing. But I hope that we can organize a, a, an event here at Hudson, at Hudson with somebody from Russia, somebody from Iran, somebody from Zimbabwe. And, and you will see the diversity of people, the diversity of countries, and the similarities of what we are facing. And also the similarities in what we are asking from our free world partners, the United States, Europe, on the type of support that, that we need in order to continue the struggle. So we had our first event in November of last year in Lithuania. Uh, we gather almost 200 activists from 44 countries. Uh, and uh, only last week, we had uh, the launch of one of uh, the main programs that we are focusing on, which is the Freedom Academy. The, it's an initiative to train at the grassroots level um, activists to uh, have the capacity to build movements, to articulate civil resistance and nonviolent action. Uh, and we hope that this becomes a massive endeavor that we give the capacity to individuals in every autocratic country to um, ha be better equipped, uh, to be better prepared to struggle against uh, the autocratic regimes. So that's what the Liberty Congress uh, is. And, um, and for me, it's very clear that this is a way to influence uh, our own particular struggle in Venezuela. Because if I only talk about Venezuela, we, we will have a limited audience. Um, but if the problem that we present is not Venezuela, Venezuela is a showcase of a larger problem, which is the lack of freedom in the world, which is the attack on human rights, which is the dismantling of democracy, 
Well, that is something that could be of interest to somebody in Iowa or in Ohio that has never heard of Venezuela or has nothing to do with Venezuela, but they might be interested in, uh, in freedom at large, in human rights, in democracy, in the values. So one of the things that we want to do with the Liberty Congress is to put this conversation at the values level. I mean, if, if these are the things that this country was built upon, if these are the ideas that this country was built upon, uh, it should be expanded because if, you know, this constitution says um, all men are created equal, well, that's all men beyond the borders of the United States. It doesn't matter where they are. Men, women, it doesn't matter where they are. Uh, we need to be engaged in the promotion of freedom, human rights, and democracy. And I think the Liberty Congress and, and the people who uh, are gathering around this initiative can contribute in a very constructive way to the need for the American public to understand their responsibility, because it's not a favor, their responsibility to their own system and to the rest of the world to continue to be engaged in struggling and supporting um, the transition to democracies uh, in places where we are living under autocratic regimes. You mentioned some of the commonalities that, uh, that, um, that uh, these democratic movements are experiencing in different countries. Are, are you, um, w what are some of the, what are some of the commonalities that you see and with what you're describing in Venezuela is the increasing sophistication of authoritarian regimes something that uh, you're seeing worldwide or is that, uh, is, does it vary greatly from one region to another? Well, I think there are great similarities and, and, and to your point, there is a, a, an increase in sophistication in the way uh, that autocrats are dealing with, uh, um, with pro-democracy pro movements. And the numbers are very sombering. Um, so there was a study published at the New York Times a couple of months ago. Um, it was based on a, on, a, on a study from Harvard University where they compared the uh, success rates of um, pro-democracy movements over the past 50 years. So the, the golden age, uh, the golden period was the 1990s. The success rate was uh, over 50%, it was around 60%, very high. So basically, you know, uh, there was a very high chance uh, to transition to democracy if people took the streets to protest, to confront the regime at the time. At the turn of the century, that number halved to 30%. And over the past 10 years, almost none um, transitions to democracy have happened uh, effectively um, w worldwide. Um, why is this? Because people want less freedom? No, absolutely not. People even want more freedom. And I think we have seen in the surprising protests that took place in Iran for months, or in this, the bursts of protests that took place in China during the Olympics, all of those are examples of people that want to be free and are willing to protest and are willing to uh, take risks to, to commit to freedom. Uh, but autocrats are more sophisticated in their social control tactics. So now you have levels of technology that are, are being used uh, for social control. Uh, artificial intelligence is being used in China and that will very soon expand uh, throughout the world. Surveillance um, technology is being used um, and it became uh, very massive the use during COVID, even within democracies, but this is also being used uh, by autocrats to, to create levels of social control. So, um, yes, there is a, a greater level of sophistication, um, of learning amongst uh, autocrats, and also of being part of a community, because now they have their own community of autocrats. So if you have a discussion about Venezuela, or Iran, or Cuba, or Zimbabwe, or Belarus at the United Nations, you will always have you know, Russia, China, Iran defending them. So it's no longer you know, that they are isolated. It's, it's, it's not, uh, autocrats are no longer isolated as they were you know, at the turn of the century or during the 1990s. Now they have been building a community, uh, a community that has as one of its objectives to undermine the United States. They all make it very clear. They all have the same narrative against the United States, against what the United States stands for. Uh, so this is a fight being, this is a fight being fought. Uh, and sometimes I hear people, well, we shouldn't be engaged in that. And my response to that is that you might not want to, but the fight is happening. Autocrats are out there to undermine democracy worldwide. Um, they will do this uh, and they will only stop when stopped. 
and ideally stopped by the people. So giving the, the muscle, giving the support, giving the confidence uh, to the people within these autocratic regimes, for me, should be a priority. And if you think about it, it's um, uh, the, the, the level of support that is needed, it will always be a fraction of a fraction of what you might end up with a crisis that turns into a military conflict or to a wider scale conflict where the billions start adding up you know, by, uh, on, on a weekly basis. So I think that a new approach to how to strengthen uh, not just civil society, but freedom society, and I mean by freedom society, the individuals, the men and women, the movements who are willing to put their lives at risk, who are willing to take the streets, who are willing to show face against the dictators, who are willing to speak truth to power. Uh, these are the movements, these are the individuals that in my view should be supported. I know you have other commitments today, so I want to leave it there. Uh, but I think this has been an important conversation. Um, you've helped uh, clarify the, the nature of the, of the regime in Venezuela and the nature of the challenge, uh, not only with Venezuela, but with other authoritarian regimes. Uh, Leopoldo, thank you very much for coming today. I hope we can do this again in the future. Uh, thank you for your leadership, um, and uh, thank you for coming today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diane.